Hello, my name is Larry Goldenberg. I'm a urologist in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I chair the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, professor at the UBC Department of Urologic Sciences, and direct the supportive care program for prostate cancer at our large Vancouver Prostate Center. It's my pleasure to present to you on men's health, which I believe is addressing a matter of family well-being. So what exactly is men's health? A lot of people think about men's health as shown in these uh, magazine covers as you know the, the exercise, the six pack, the abs. And that's really one way to look at men's health. When we look at men's health through a urology lens, we think about prostate cancer primarily or benign growth or non-cancerous growth of the prostate, infections, sexual problems, infertility problems. That's looking at through a urology lens. So we would call it men's urology health. But men's health is really more than a prostate and a penis. And so we need to look at it through an overall lens. And that involves mental health issues, hormonal issues, heart issues, skin issues, bone issues, and so on is listed here. And urology as well. But it's a much more holistic view of what men's health really is. And the impact of men's bad health or poor health is actually shown in global life expectancy statistics. And this is from a few years ago. You can see I've highlighted in Canada and the United States that there's a gap between the life expectancy of men and women anywhere from three to five or six years. In some countries, like in Russia, it's 10 years, and in others, it's only 0.6 years. But generally, overall, if you look at these global life expectancies, the gap as shown in this graph between men in blue and women in red has been about five years for many decades. You can see in the 80s, it's spread apart a little bit, and now it's coming back together. And if we extend this graph out to the current 2023, they are coming a little bit closer together, but there's still a gap. There are other health indicators that we need to consider as well, just not how long you live, but what kind of health you have when you're living to age 80. And that's called health expectancy. How long are you really healthy? Now, the ideal for all of us would be being perfectly healthy until the day you die. Clearly, that's not the issue, or it's not reality. So how long are you free from disability? And depending on your, on your family and other members of your society to look after you while you're alive. And if we look at health expectancy, then across the Western nations, it's about a 10-year loss of healthy years between the, the, your life expectancy and your health expectancy. That's a significant gap of 10 years. So how do we explain this? And how do we explain this discrepancy between men and women? You know, there's, there's really two mysteries here. Why do men have a shorter life expectancy? Granted, it's only on average three to five years, but it's still consistent and has been for many, many years. And can we decrease the gap between life expectancy and health expectancy? How do we add 10 healthy years to the middle of a man's life? So what about life expectancy? So there's a number of factors that contribute to this life expectancy gap. There are biological factors related to hormone differences, brain structure differences, other physical differences clearly between men and women, environmental factors and behavioral factors. And if we just explore these a little bit more, the male brain, no question, there are big differences between men and women as illustrated here. But environmental factors are probably most important to explain a lot of the differences between particularly early deaths and earlier years of men's life. For example, men tend to have more physically laborious and dangerous jobs. But again, you know, in today's society, those gaps are narrowing a little bit. Women are taking on more of these more dangerous jobs than they did a couple of decades ago. Social support, men have fewer intimate friends. Men are less likely to have a confidant in times of stress. And there's been studies that have been published showing that those with low levels of social support are two to three times more likely to die at a younger age. And then there are the behavioral factors. For example, health-promoting behaviors or preventative measures. Men do less of them. Sleep less, 
rush recovery times, use seat belts less, take fewer medications and supplements, use less sun protection, have more unhealthy diets. And men use healthcare services less often than women. At all ages, shown here, women see the doctor or visit uh, healthcare professionals way more often than men do. Now, it's interesting, up until age 15, it's about equal. That's because mom is looking after you. And as men enter into their adolescent, teenage, and then young adult years, the gap starts to widen. Probably because women need to see the doctor for reproductive issues, whereas men are getting busy and just ignoring their health. That gap exists right through until older ages. So some of the reasons men don't attend to a doctor, and we're mostly talking about men between the ages of 20 and 40, they feel vulnerable. They don't want to give up control of their health or of their bodies. They don't want to share their private issues with, with a stranger. And there's systemic barriers, the wait times to be seen, the hours that offices are open don't always correspond well to work hours, where the offices are, lack of male health care providers, and taking time from work to care for themselves. It's interesting that health consciousness and behavior really has two peaks with a big dip in between in that age group between 30 and 40. When men are in their 20s, their health is driven by vanity. They want to look good. They want to look strong. They would need to attract a mate. And then later on in life, 50, 60, they have children, they have grandchildren, and they're starting to think, hmm, you know, the, the, uh, the end is not far off now. I'm entering the, the final third of my life. I want to see my grandchildren graduate from high school. I want to see my granddaughter get married, and so on. So they start to pay more attention to their health. But risk-taking behaviors, men do more of them. They engage in more high-risk leisure activities, sports, more sexual partners at a younger age, violent behaviors, drive drunk more frequently, more alcohol and tobacco use. And you can see in the picture here, they do some very strange things. So there is definitely room for behavioral improvement in men. And if you're still not convinced, have a look at this. And having a Y chromosome is not an excuse for self-destruction. So we can, we can overcome this, the fact that we have a Y chromosome and testosterone levels. So as it says, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. So what's causing loss of healthy years, that discrepancy between life expectancy and health expectancy? Men carry out suicide successfully three to four times more than women especially in the middle age. So blue on this graph here, you can see as this is the age group going along the bottom here, as in the in middle ages, there's a huge gap between men and women. And men, when they decide they're gonna commit suicide, they use more lethal methods. Motor vehicle accidents, again, big difference, particularly in the, in the 20s and 30s here between men and women, and again, over age 80 between men and women. Alcohol abuse is six times higher for men than women, and particularly in the younger age groups. And I'm coming to this, I keep emphasizing this 18, 20, 30 year. This is really our target audience. This is where we make the biggest difference, as I'll come to later on in the talk. Cancers are more likely to be diagnosed in men, and when they're diagnosed, they're more likely to die, men are more likely to die as a result of cancer. It may be because of delays in uh, diagnosis. Diabetes, not big differences between men and women in the actual incidence, but males are 39% more likely to die of complications of diabetes. And again, it may have to do with um, you know, whether they're taking their medications, whether they're following the diets and the doctor's recommendations. Homicides, again, more men than women. Substance abuse, much more common in men than in women. And it's hard to believe that people are still smoking. And a lot of deaths are attributed to smoking. Men and mental health, more common than in, in, in women. This illnesses like schizophrenia are more common in men and, as, and so forth. Obesity. 
men are on average two to four times more likely to be overweight or obese than women. Now, again, these statistics are a little bit uh, aged. And uh, in today's world, I think that the gaps are narrowing a little bit, but men are still um, more likely to be overweight. So what about general awareness of the problem? You know, I think this is it. This is the crux of the matter and has been for decades. That, you know, we stick our heads in the sand. We just ignore the problems. But I'm a urologist. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you why a urologist is talking to you about men's health, which should really should be a social movement. And it's because urology is a portal into men's health. We see a lot of men and we see a lot of boys because they have, you know, children, you know, kids with voiding abnormalities, urinary infections. We see middle-aged, young and to middle-aged men with uh, reproductive issues, infertility issues, infections, prostatitis, and then as men are getting older, urinary tract symptoms, like urination problems, kidney stones, blood in the urine, testosterone issues. We see a lot of things that are related to other diseases. And there are a lot of risk factors for many of these illnesses that we see as urologists that underlie other important diseases, smoking, diet, exercise, drugs, blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. And if we look at this chart, you can see down the left side, these are very common illnesses that we see regularly as urologists. And look across the top, you can see the risk factors that are underlying heart disease, for example. And you can see that there's a commonality between all of these risk factors, urinary, urological diseases, and other illnesses. So we have this opportunity to engage with men who are coming to see us and with their partners, of course. But we see men, for example, a 35 year old having a vasectomy. You can ask them, you know, you're, you've got a few minutes uh, while you're doing the procedure. Ask the, the young man, does he know his family history? About 20% of men do not know their family history. Did their father or their grandfather have a heart attack or a stroke or diabetes or colon cancer? Or a 50-year-old with declining erections. You know, that might be the canary in, in the mine shaft of he's got underlying arterial problems that are could lead to a, to a heart attack or a stroke in the very near future, but it's presenting firstly as erectile problems. 63-year-olds with urinary troubles, a 58-year-old with bladder cancer. The cancer may be related to smoking. 44-year-old with kidney stones. They can have all kinds of metabolic problems. And I'm just going to take you through an example of a 55-year-old man who presents with prostate cancer. That gives us the opportunity to address four risk factors. Smoking, obesity, metabolic syndrome, alcohol intake and physical inactivity. So I'm seeing this man with prostate cancer, but I have an opportunity to talk to him about other risk factors that may relate to him or perhaps to his father or his brother or his son or someone, one of his friends, that he can talk to them. So we don't necessarily or very often think about smoking related to prostate cancer, but it's been established that smokers have an 80% higher risk of a recurrence from their prostate cancer after they've been treated, and a 61% higher risk of dying from prostate cancer than men who have never smoked. And related to the smoking, they have a 200 plus percent higher risk of a heart attack or a stroke. So pretty good reason to stop smoking. And it's been shown that men who quit smoking for 10 or more years, or who have quit for less than 10 years, but had never smoked more than 20 pack years, that their risks are similar to non-smokers. Obesity is known to increase the risks of prostate, prostate cancer, and we're all aware of all the other risks of obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and so on. But Norway, Finland, Portugal, Korea, Austria, studies from all of these countries over the last decade have shown that overweight and obese status are associated with a higher incidence of prostate cancer, more unfavorable pathology, more aggressive cancers, and biochemical recurrences or relapses. 
It's something that men can control. It's amazing when you realize it takes an oak tree 200 years to attain that girth. Dietary fat, and Mark is an expert in the field, of, but saturated fats are bad for you. They're bad for every part of you. They're bad for your brain. They're bad for your heart. They're bad for your colon, and they're bad for your prostate. And that's pretty well known that a dietary, a dietary modifications, a Mediterranean diet is a good thing. It decreases mortality from prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, other cancers. And bottom line, a heart healthy diet is a prostate healthy diet. And I tell all of my patients that. And finally, alcohol. It's causally related. The WHO has reported on this to a number of cancers. So and though it's not wine and beer, good news, not causally related to prostate cancer, hard liquor is, increases the risk by 60%. And the evidence for the harmful effects of alcohol in men is stronger than beneficial effects. And it, this sh just shows you a review of 27 studies from 16 countries showed the increased risk of diagnosing and men dying related to alcohol intake. In Canada, just recently, the um, public health agency suggested that less than or equal to two drinks per day is the, which should be your standard. And finally, exercise. Well established that exercise is the best medicine for so many parts of your body. And so if a man comes to me with prostate cancer, before treatment, during treatment, after treatment, we're encouraging them to exercise vigorously, more than three hours a week. And that decreases death rates and the risks of developing fatal disease. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Hard message, but reality. And I, I think that uh, Mark will say this and agree that give me 30 minutes a day and I'll give you a decrease in premature death, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, breast cancer, and on and on. Unfortunately, as I showed earlier, we have our men have their heads buried deeply in the sand and would rather take pills, surgery, and so on, rather than a simple lifestyle change. And that's where the Canadian Men's Health Foundation came in. In 2014, we rolled out a non-governmental agency called the CMHF, which we identified as a social movement. And the mission of this organization is to inspire men to live healthier lives, to pay attention to these risk factors, to pay attention to preventative measures. So how many men really are sick? Like, what's our target audience? Well, this fellow says 50 fat diabetic ahead of you. But how many men really are? And we did a survey in Canada recently that shows that 72% of Canadian men are unhealthy. Now, Canada is just a mini United States. And I would project that the exact same numbers if we were to do this in US or UK or other Western nations would be about the same. 6% of men are identified as being very healthy. So 6% of men can ignore everything I've just said, continue to do what they do. They've got good genetics, they're exercising, they've got a good diet, they're not drinking too much, they don't smoke and on and on. 22% would consider themselves healthy. So they're gonna live long lives and they follow most of those things. 31% are borderline and 41% are really unhealthy. And so you put those last two to number, 72% of Canadian men would, are borderline unhealth or unhealthy. And we know that of the chronic diseases that we identify in later, in later age groups, 70% of them are preventable through lifestyle changes upstream or earlier in life. So we can present up to we can prevent up to 70% of men's chronic diseases through lifestyle changes in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Give your head a shake, guys. Okay. Also, we are very strong examples to our children. And really interesting research in the last few years on the impact of fathers on their children have shown, for example, obese fathers are 10 times more likely to have obese children. It doesn't apply to obese women, just to the men. The impact of poor health in unhealthy men, we negatively impact family, communities, healthcare system, the general economy, especially 
apparent in indigenous and hard to reach populations. The pandemic didn't help us much. It drastically increased the demand for men's mental and physical health care services and for women's. There are consequences to our family and to our community. Sorry for the misspelled spelling there. Intrafamily caregiving patterns change. Close to 50% of women are widowed by age 65. Over 50% of elderly widows are living in poverty and they were not poor before the deaths of their husbands. And at age 95, women outnumber men eight to one. The economic cost of society. This was a study that the Canadian Men's Health Foundation did a few years ago, looking at the direct and indirect costs of chronic health diseases in men. And the total due to bad lifestyle behaviors was almost $37 billion per year. And it costs our family. If you just think of the economic cost, you're paying for, you know, your alcohol, you're paying for cigarettes, you're paying for the food and all that extra weight you're carrying around. Plus you're, you're paying your insurance premiums. So anywhere from 1.7 to $8.6 million lifetime could be saved with upstream or earlier in life modifications in lifestyle. That's a lot of money. So how do we do it? How can we add 10 healthy years to the middle of a man's life? Well, we have to talk to them. We've got to educate men. We've got to advocate. We've got to get guys to think. We've got to get guys to appreciate that this can be done. Is it possible? Can we talk to men about their health? It's tough because men are generally tuned out. But we feel that men's health should be and can be a habit just like seatbelts, just like helmets, just like recycling. These are habits that have taken time, and but now after years, they're instinctive, they're accepted, they're expected. When my kids were small, they wouldn't let me turn on the car until I, I put on my seatbelt. It's a habit that's become natural. But talking to men can be like banging your head against the wall. It's, it is not easy, but if we don't start, and we don't pay attention and really give it an effort, we're not going to get there. So with the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, we identify, we know what the problem is. Poor men's health, 72% of men have some degree of unhealthiness. Okay, What we want to do is develop, we decided to develop programs and which will lead to results. We don't have a clinic. This is not a urology clinic. It's not a net men's health hospital. It's a it, more, more than anything else, it's a social media-based advocacy and education. So it's an awareness to action. We got to get men men's attention. Then we got to get them thinking. Then we got to get them talking and knowing and finally acting. And this is a cycle that is very, very possible. Just takes a little bit of effort. Our Canadian Men's Health Foundation resources uh, have grown over the last. Uh, decade. We have programs. Uh, our two main brands are Don't Change Much and the Men's Health Check. And I'll just touch on those very briefly. The Don't Change Much campaign uses champions, and I'll give, show you our champions later, uses humor, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, to speak to guys in ways that they'll hear, absorb, and act on. Now, I'm going to inter interject here and say that not every man hears the message in the same way. Okay. And we've done study on the morphological differences between men's ability to hear and understand. That's a whole other lecture. But as you can appreciate, some men are way more open to hearing the message, absorbing it, and acting on it than other men. But we do the best we can. And we want men to just make small incremental changes. If you tell a guy, you know, you got to do A, B, C, D, and E, he's very unlikely to do even A. But if you say, let's start with a small incremental change, that'll make a big difference. Perhaps, you know, half salad, half fries. Instead of two beers, have one beer. You know, tell your friends to have one beer as well, and so on. Or, you know, walk a little bit further, take the stairs at work. Little things like that, they can make a big difference in how you eventually feel in your overall health. And these little changes become habits, and multiple small habits will coalesce to become more permanent behavioral changes with put really huge potential for downstream impact. And we'll give you this uh, web address again, but 
don'tchangemuch.ca is well worth a look. And if you're a woman looking at this video, tell your husband, tell your brother, tell your father. I would, I would have liked to have called this uh, Canadian Men's Health Foundation the Canadian Dad's Health Foundation or the Canadian Son's Health Foundation or the Canadian Brother's Health Foundation because it implies to them all. Lately, I've been thinking about making some changes in my life, taking a new approach, changing my ways, little stuff, you know, like taking the stairs once in a while, drinking more water, or swapping fries for salad sometimes. A few small steps like that will make me feel better now and down the road. I mean, I wouldn't want to be a burden on my wife. Ain't that right, honey? Change, but don't change much. Get simple tips at don'tchangemuch.ca. So this was one of our videos. I'm going to show you another one. We had controversy over videos and showing videos uh, on social networks, and um, not everybody thought it was funny, but those people aren't necessarily our targets. Our targets are the 20-year-old, the 25, the 30-year-old, just like the man, you know, slightly overweight guy in the, in in this in this video. And I went here's down another one. To watch the fish swim by. But I got to the river so long as I wanted to die. And alone. And when I jumped in the river, the doggone river was dry. She's long gone. And now I'm lost. So we have many, many videos like that. We had one video, which I could show later on, but about prostate cancer screening that the news networks didn't want to show because it was provocative and um, they just said no, they didn't want to show it. But the news item was the fact that the news networks didn't want to show the video, which got us more attention than the actual video would have gotten us. So we work in that social... Uh, uh, media sphere that's very very important in that same sphere we've had podcasts every june is men's health month and we provide um these podcasts with which given an outlet for for men um really who are hard to reach otherwise for them to listen to very positive information messages about mental health physical health and they're usually um, podcasts in Canada by um, our champions who are well-known uh, celebrities across the country and are are able to get the attention of a young 25-year-old or 30-year-old who wouldn't necessarily listen to a almost 70-year-old urologist. Uh, we have a men's health check. This is a, an interesting tool that we introduced eight years ago and um, just revised. We brought it up to up to date. And what it does is it identifies men. It takes just a few minutes, really. Uh, you log in and you answer some questions of having related to diet and family history. And, and it will identify the eight most common health diseases in men. And it gives you a, basically a, a risk. It says you're at high risk for heart disease or you're high risk for sexual dysfunction or you're high risk for prostate cancer. You might want to go and see a doctor or talk to a doctor. We have a men's health checklist. This is an interactive checklist that covers 21 different health tests, examinations, and screens that men should have at different ages. And it basically says this is how often we, you know experts recommend that you have these tests done. And it's a great checklist. Um, so again have a look at it or get your partner to have a look at that. Uh, more recently, we began a MindFit toolkit, especially after the pandemic with the high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. And this is an opportunity for men to go online. There's There are questionnaires, there are validated uh, screens for depression, anxiety, stress, and, and so on. And we actually offer an opportunity for men free of charge to engage with a healthcare worker to talk about these things. And lastly, we have a campaign on diet. Um, we provide appointments with um, dietitians, and we're monitoring this to see how effective this can be. 
These are our champions. If you're a Canadian uh, viewing this, you will recognize many of these individuals, these men and women um, who are celebrities in our country and they are well respected and they take a stand for men's health and they want to inspire men to make these small changes in our Don't Change Much campaign. So it's great, we've got all this campaign, but is it effective? It's very important for us to show that it is making an impact on men's health and lessen the impact on our healthcare system. And our data, we, we have um, extensive outcome metrics, but just showing some of the data here, 75% of men who have participated in the Don't Change Much campaign have improved their eating habits. 45% have decreased their alcohol intake. 70% are exercising more. 46% have lost weight. And 35% have reduced their stress levels. So we are pleased with these numbers. I think we still have a ways to go. If you think about 72% of men not being totally healthy, that's a lot of men. So we got a long ways to go. But again, I come back to this issue that it's the last piece of the puzzle of family health, women's health. We don't want to ignore women's health. Great progress in women's health over the decades. Let's keep it going. Same with children's health, minority health. But let's plug in men's health because it's part of the family. It's a critical part of the family. And I would emphasize that it's not a competitive victim's discourse. This is not about men versus women. Men need their partners to steer them. They need their daughters. They need their, they need their husbands if that's the situation, whatever it is, it is not a single person. It is a dyadic approach, okay? And I think that that is where the success is gonna be, where we consider it family health and not just men's health. And I thank you for your attention. And I listed here are the uh, websites, the menshealthfoundation.ca and don'tchangemuch.ca. I strongly encourage you to go to them and view some of the programs that we've developed and have your loved ones do the same. Thank you.